Okay, hello. Um, um, okay, welcome to the 100C. The empiricists. I'm Abe Stone. You can call me Professor Stone, or you can call me Abe. I'm completely fine either way. Um, and uh, I apologize for the way we're starting off the quarter on Zoom this way. I I hope that next week uh, we may be back in person. I'm not sure yet, but I'll definitely let you know by the end of the week. Um, okay, so um, yeah, my plan today is just to go through the syllabus and then give a brief introduction to the content of the course. Um, just want to share my screen. Yeah. Um, So uh, best way to reach me is by email. I try to check it at least a couple times a day when I'm teaching. Um, this footnote here says, please feel free to contact the instructor, that is me, and or your TA with questions about the substance of the course. Um, on administrative issues, grades, lateness, extensions, due dates, etc. Please try your TA first. So, like, if you try me first, I won't be mad at you or whatever, but uh, it'll be nice to try your TA first. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, I didn't put my office phone number here. You could find it if you want, but it's not a good way to reach me. This is where my office is. I think, uh, I you know, I don't know when my office hours will be yet. I probably... Uh, well, if and when I start coming back to campus, I probably will have in-person office hours and also Zoom all the way up. Those, but I don't know exactly what else would be. Um, these are the two TAs and the emails. Um, and I have a list here of which sections each one is teaching and when they are, but I don't. But I guess you can easily figure that out. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the TAs will have some kind of office hours. Uh, I know um, uh, Enoch said he wants to fix an office hour. I don't know if Chelsea wants to fix it or have it by appointment. Uh, I'll, I'll announce that um, next time, I guess. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the the normal modality for this course uh, is that I will lecture in person, but I will still uh, zoom, stream all the lectures via Zoom, and I'm also going to record all the lectures and post them on this YouTube playlist that there's a link to here. Um, um, so, uh, and I'm not going to be taking attendance. Attendance at lectures is not required. Uh, attendance at lectures is strongly suggested. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I hope everyone comes, and I hope if you can come in person, that you come in person. I mean, when the lecture is in person, that's definitely better. Uh, but if you can't, or or don't want to, there's these other ways of seeing the lecture. Um, okay, uh, course requirements. Um, oh, and I should mention also, so what I just said about the normal modality, except for these three makeup lectures that I'm giving because of Passover. So right, there's three 
Monday classes that I'm going to miss because of Passover. And in place of those, I'm getting three Thursday classes. So they're going to be at the regular class time, but on Thursday instead of Monday or Wednesday um, uh, by Zoom only. And obviously, a lot of people may not be able to come to those unusual times, but uh, if you can't come, you can watch the recorded lecture. Okay. Um, all right, course requirements. Um, participation in discussion sections. So, um, um, so participation in discussion sections is a course requirement, but the way that works is that, um, um, first of all, it's about participation, not attendance. Wait, so like on the one hand, if you don't go to every single section, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not a good participant. And on the other hand, if you do go to every single section, but you never say anything, that's not participation, right? So good participation in sections um, is possible grounds for raising your grade if it's near a borderline. So that means that, you know, it's positive, but not negative, right? In other words, you could get an A for the course and never participate in section. Um, uh, but um, uh, usually a fair number of grades are near a borderline. So, um, so this does have some effect. Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't participate in section, you, you miss out on that. Looks like there's something in the chat here. Oh, it's from Otto. Okay. Oh, yeah. AI chat. All right. Um, um, so then I have these things called metaphysics exercises or reasons that I don't know. Maybe don't make sense anymore. I'm not sure why I call them that. In any case, the metaphysics exercises, they're kind of quiz. They're, you take them via the quiz tool on Canvas, but they're not like timed or anything like that. So not, they're not really quizzes. Um, and there, there's going to be ones that are due on about half of the class days. So about once per week, but some weeks there's two and some weeks there's none. You have to look um, uh, people will usually find these questions fairly difficult. Um, but uh, don't worry about that too much. They're graded heavily on a curve. Um, so uh, um, typically people who get like even one answer right <laughs> during the entire quarter are, still don't fail the metaphysics exercises. That, that's probably like a C or something. So, um, uh, and the most common grades on the metaphysics exercises will be B plus and A minus. So the similar grades will be similar to the papers. And I'm emphasizing that because we'll, you know, for those who haven't seen these metaphysics exercises before, so some people who are just in 100B have seen them. But if you haven't seen them before, you may reach a point in the middle of the course where you say, you know, oh goodness, I'm only getting 50% right, I'm failing. But no, if you're getting 50% right, you may well be getting an A minus, right? It's like a very end curve. All right. Um, I'll, I'm, I know I'll probably have to say that again as the quarter goes on and I get panic questions about it, but I'll, I'm saying it now. Um, all right, so, and those are, um, right, so those, like each individual question is not worth that much, but I'll put together the, the grade, right? So in other words, I'll, I'll change the, scores into letter grades using that heavy curve. And then that grade is 30% of your course grade. So you should definitely do this, right? I mean, and you know, 
it's not like the SAT, there's no penalty for guessing. So, I mean, like even if you don't know the answer at all, you should do them and guess. <laughs> um, so, uh, but of course the idea of them is not to guess. <laughs> the idea of them is to, um, and you know, they'll be due on, uh, so like there'll be a reading and I'll give a lecture about that reading. And then the metaphysics exercise that's key to that reading will be due like the class after that. So it's really supposed to be like a way of getting you to like go back and think more carefully about what happened in the reading. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of the difficulty of them turns on like making sure you're keeping track of the terminology that our philosophers <laughs> use. In this course, all the philosophers we're reading wrote originally in English. So uh, we don't have to worry about translation. That's great. Um, although as you'll see their English, especially locks is a little bit different than our English, not too different. But, um, okay, so other than that, there's um, three paper assignments, two short ones. These two short ones are not really, uh, they're more writing exercises than they are papers, right? So like the first one is gonna be to take a short passage in Locke and explain uh, how there's two different ways you can understand it, basically. And this, the second one is something it's a little bit different, but it's a similar type of exercise about Barclay. Um, and then at the end, there's one longer final paper and there's a list of suggested topics for that, which all these assignments are already up and you can look at them, uh, but I won't, I'll talk about them in more detail sooner before they're due. Um, oh, and for the final paper, um, so I don't think it makes sense in a course that's like in a 10 week course that require everyone to hand in a draft. I mean, you would have to start writing before the, you read most of the reading or something. But in, in lieu of that, what I have is that uh, a week before the final paper is due, the, uh, um, you're supposed to hand in a first paragraph and an outline of your final paper. Now you don't have to use that first paragraph or follow that outline. In fact, the idea of it is that then you hand it in and you can get feedback on it from the TA um, and your fellow students. And then hopefully you could, you know, write a better paper based on that. Um, so there isn't a separate grade assigned to that outline assignment. Um, but if you don't hand it in at all, or I've never had to use this clause, but it's there just in case, or if it is wholly unsatisfactory, right? Meaning it's not a paragraph and an outline at all, basically, right? So, and so, so like if you if you if you don't do the assignment at all, then your final paper grade will be reduced by a half step. So again, obviously, you should do this. It doesn't have to be good. Uh, I mean, the better it is, the more it will help you write the final paper, obviously. But in order to not lose that half step, it doesn't have to be any good at all, just some paragraph and outline. Okay. Um, and the papers are to be handed in on Canvas. This quarter, I have already created all the assignments on Canvas. So there won't, hopefully won't be any last, last minute panic about how to hand them in. And actually this quarter, I also, the first, I think five metaphysics exercises are already up as well. I mean, you don't want to do them now before we do the reading, but I, you could if you want. Anyway, they're there. Um, after that, we'll be back to probably to me doing it the last minute. Um, uh, plagiarizing, please don't do it. Um, it's, it's such a pain. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, and I guess I would say like, well, this is the explanation I give basically every course. I'd say, you know, 
Um, the only reason I've ever failed a paper that someone actually handed in. So obviously, if someone doesn't hand an assignment at all, I can't give a credit, right? <laughs> Said nothing. But but the only time I've ever failed a paper that someone actually handed in is because I, you know, because it included plagiarism. So uh, just you know, like. If all huge parts of your paper are copied from Wikipedia or whatever, just put quotes around them and put a footnote, and it won't be a good paper, but it won't fail. <laughs> so um, now, of course, I don't know if anyone would do that now, because now there's the other option of asking ChatGPT to write your paper. Please don't do that either. <laughs> um, I, you know. I actually have used ChatGPT quite a bit. I, I, I like ChatGPT, it's good for some things. It would not be good at doing the assignments for this course. Um, so it won't write a good paper. Uh, and I feel like the TAs and I would recognize it. And I mean, I know I got some last year that I was sure were written by ChatGPT, but it was like, I can't prove anything. So I didn't do anything about them except give them a low grade. But this year, I think if I see some that I'm sure written by ChatGPT, I'm going to like report them up the chain and see what happens. So, you know, don't do that. Uh, again, if you feel like you need ChatGPT to help you write part of the paper and you just have to put it in, you can't think of it yourself, put it in quotes and put a footnote saying ChatGPT. <laughs> I don't advise writing the paper that way, but that wouldn't be cheating or plagiarism, right? As it says here in this AI, this very rudimentary AI policy, basically whatever you could do with a human being, you can do with the AI. So there's some things you could use a human being for, and you wouldn't have to cite them, right? Like if you ask someone, hey, where can I find a book about X? And they said, oh, why don't you look at this one? You wouldn't have to put a footnote, right? But if they told you some stuff, some ideas to put in your paper and you put them in like either verbatim or just paraphrasing them, right? You would have to credit them. And it's the, the same, so the same thing goes for, for using an AI. And all assignments are due at 11.55 PM and the due date, I just, I don't really like, have a stopwatch and like try to figure out exactly when the assignments came in, but I put that there because otherwise everyone asks me what, what time they do. So that's what I do. Oh, I'm sure it's not the end. Um, um, okay, yes, Josephine says it would be polite if someone suggested a book to, uh, I, I guess, I don't know, uh, up the point. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, not, not doing so is not plagiarism, that's for sure. Okay, so these are the texts that uh, require text for the course. Um, um, since there's no translations, all, like every edition that you would find of these works, it basically has the same words in it. Uh, actually, there is one caveat about that. There's a site, I think it's called earlymodernphilosophy.com or you no, know, I don't know. There's a, there's a site where someone took it upon themselves to translate early modern English text into modern English. That, I don't know. To me, that seems like the most long-headed thing you could possibly do. Um, obviously, they disagree with me. But yeah, don't, don't use those. I mean, if you have the ability to see the original text, that's like such a huge advantage. You don't want to throw it away. Um, but, uh, but other than, with that exception, whatever edition you find is going to have the same text. And so uh, it doesn't really matter. And including, <clears throat> there's various public domain versions available that I have links to here. Um, there's also public domain recordings of these texts that I have links to here on LibriVox. Um, for me, reading a book the first time, 
a philosophy book the first time, but I don't know, maybe I have done that now and it wasn't bad. I listened to John Stuart Mill's logic earlier this year. And yeah, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, so if you prefer doing it that way, go ahead. Um, the only disadvantage if you have a different edition is that sometimes I'm going to give page numbers. And then, you know, if you have a different edition, that won't help you. Um, <clears throat> do be careful not to buy the packet editions of this Locke, Locke's essay or Hume's treatise because they're both abridged. Um, and even though we're not going to be re reading all, or in Hume's case, even most of, actually, I guess even in Locke's <laughs> case, we're not reading most of the text so long. Um, that uh, the, the the way I'm abridging it is not the way that they abridged it. So you need the, you need the whole thing. Um, okay. And they these are also all, on, these editions are all unreserved. Um, are there questions about any of that stuff? Yes, Matt. Yeah, so right now, my uh, physical copy books are still shipping in the mail. So I'm going to have to do these uh, the the public domain books are the pages corresponding to the pages on the uh, on the reading portion, or is or are they not corresponding? No, they're they're not corresponding. But uh, most most of the, if not all, of the readings are assigned um, in a way that you can find them without using the page numbers, right? In fact, I didn't even put page numbers here. Right, so it says lock essay, book one, chapter one, section. As this footnote says, this symbol stands for section. <laughs> and two of them mean sections. It also suggests where you could go if you don't know, if you're worried about reading Roman numerals. Uh, although you could also just type Roman numerals into Google and it will tell you. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so it says book one, chapter one, section eight. So that's going to be the same in every edition. Okay, good question. Are there more questions? So I just to clarify, so I'm looking at the public domain online version. And so yeah. on, under each chapter, there's a number corresponding to each paragraph. Each number is an individual section. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, any other questions about any of that stuff? Uh, about, about any of the stuff I just went through on the syllabus? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Josephine says, I saw an essay and I expected it to be short. It is not. <laughs> no. That's like, it did not mean short in those days. <laughs> Very long. All right. Um, let me stop sharing the screen then. Um, oh, did I mention? Oh, yeah, I did talk about it. Okay. Yes, I talked about all those things. Okay. Um, So uh, I'm going to say a little bit now about the history of philosophy uh, leading up to this period and why we divide this period the way we do. Um, uh, if you just took 100B with me, you heard a longer version of this at the beginning of 100B. Um, but um, uh, since not everyone just took 100B, and you go through some version of it. So, um, right. So basically, like, yeah, I'm not going to draw my timeline timeline of the entire history of philosophy, but we had like. There was ancient philosophy. 
And this is the history of Western philosophy. Um, there are other, perhaps many other philosophical traditions besides Western philosophy, um, but um, this is Western philosophy. Okay, so we had ancient philosophy um, and medieval philosophy. Ancient philosophy was mostly written in Greek. So like the first thousand years of Western philosophy, most philosophy was written in Greek, right? That is even uh, um, in, so actually in the Roman empire and the Eastern empire, the official language was Greek. Even in the Western empire where the official language was Latin, most people wrote philosophy in Greek. Um, there were some important things written in Latin, Cicero and Seneca and other people wrote philosophy in Latin, but it was mostly Greek. Um, and then, uh, you know, there was like the sack of Rome and all that stuff and ancient philosophy and, <laughs> um, and uh, um, philosophy really picked up again. Um, the, mm, or 200 years later in Baghdad, um, there was a school of Christian peripatetics. That means like followers of Aristotle in Baghdad. Um, they, they actually, I think, were already mostly reading Aristotle in Syriac, which was a kind of Aramaic, but they, they took on the task of translating Aristotle either from Greek or from Syriac into Arabic. Um, um, and, uh, so there followed, you know, several centuries of where most of uh, the most important medieval philosophy was written in Arabic. And then that, that tradition didn't really end. I mean, in some ways it's still going on, but at a, at a certain time it, it kind of lessened. Um, but fortunately around the same time, people started translating that stuff from Latin, from Arabic into Latin. And in Western Europe, where they, you know, where philosophy had been pretty quiescent, they didn't have access to very much because they didn't know Greek anymore, most of them. And uh, it wasn't very much available in Latin. Um, and besides, it was the Dark Ages, and there, you know, there were no universities yet, and whatever. <laughs> um, but um, at some point in the late 12th and, uh, and during the course of the 13th century, uh, you know, a, a large part of the philosophy that was available in Arabic was translated into Latin. So, like Aristotle and some of his ancient commentators and his uh, um, his medieval Arabic followers, all that stuff got translated into Latin. And then a little bit later, they were able to translate the Greek originals um, in, you know, which were in Constantinople, right? Because that part of the Roman Empire still existed and its language was Greek. <laughs> Right? So they preserved those texts there and they translated them from Greek into Latin. And there followed the later part of medieval philosophy where it was mostly in Latin. Um, and during, so from the end of the ancient period, I haven't really, these should be not lines, but like periods, right? So from the end of later parts of the ancient period, all through the medieval period, um, most philosophers were Aristotelians. In fact, they called Aristotle the philosopher. <laughs> um, and, um, and in certain contexts, philosophy was even like synonymous with Aristotelianism. So that like those philosophers who were anti-Aristotelian called themselves, said they were against philosophy or against the philosophers. <laughs> Um, so most of the philosophers were Aristotelian. What does that mean? They were followers of Aristotle, right? Aristotle is way back here. 
but they were followers of Aristotle. They were, um, they, they mostly had some kind of mixture of Plato and Aristotle really in their views, but, um, but even those in the later antiquity who considered themselves Platonists were in a way more Aristotelian than Platonist. So do, we have this long period of Aristotelianism. What does that mean? Well, it means that they all agreed with each other that Aristotle was right about almost everything. But they didn't agree about what Aristotle means. So they were able to disagree with each other about almost everything else. OK, I see there's two questions that have come in here. I was blabbering away. I have a quick question about the grade scale. Can we earn A plus? Yeah, I had some questions about this lab. Has this changed some, somehow? Because I never had students ask me about this A plus thing until this year. And now all of a sudden, everyone who's going to law school wants me to give them an A plus. Um, a few people who were planning to apply to law school asked me for an A plus last quarter. So first of all, I usually have not used the grade A plus. Like, I don't know what it means exactly. They didn't have A plus where I went to school. Uh, so um, uh, some people asked me if I could give them an A plus. I looked and I saw that those people had done well but the, there were a bunch of other students who had done as well or better. And I realized I would have to open up a whole can of worms and start giving everyone an A+. Plus. <laughs> so I decided to hold off on it. I hope that won't prevent anyone from getting into the law school of their choice. Um, I'll have to think about it more to see. Um, Um, I don't know. I have to think about it. I have, like I said, I think I think I would only use it. I think, but uh, I have to think about it. But I think I would only use a plus if there were, you know, very few people, one or two or three, who clearly stood out from the rest of the class. That. Uh, really wasn't it through last quarter. I mean, maybe it was because it was a really good class last quarter, and maybe that ended up hurting people and who wanted A pluses. But anyway, um, yeah, that's my answer for now. Um, okay, I will think about it. Other question. Uh, do we have any idea of the accuracy of those translations? How much noise does one get when translating from ancient Greek to Latin or whatever? That's that's an excellent question. Um, so these translations, um, um, so we, I mean, we we have the translations, not all of them. Some, although there's actually. So there's some ancient Greek works that only survive in Arabic or Latin translation. <laughs> Not very many, but there's also like things that we know were available in Arabic, but we don't have it anymore. Uh, so, um, but we have, you know, the main works, we, you know, we, we still have the translations, you can look at them. Um, they're, uh, they're very literal translations. So they actually, they, they tend to distort the, the um, target language in order to make it stand in an almost one-to-one -one correspondence to the original. So they'll even sometimes distort the grammar or actually my favorite example of this is that um, in Latin, there's no articles, right? There's no definite or indefinite article. Whereas Greek has definite articles. And sometimes there's some important philosophical uses of the definite article in Greek. And so one of the important medieval translators, um, William of Merbeck, um, 
at some point started putting in the French definite article le into his Latin translations from Greek. Because <laughs> he was like, I need a definite article. And Latin doesn't have one. And you know, French, I guess, was his native language. And so he just stuck the French article in. <laughs> so so the answer is, I think that like for someone who was willing to study them carefully and realize that this was not ordinary Latin or ordinary Arabic, but that you had to like figure out how these people talk. Um, these translations were actually really good. What's not to say that it didn't introduce some changes. I mean, there's some things that are hard to overcome. You know, like they had their work cut out for like Arabic doesn't have a present tense verb to be. <laughs> so, like, if you think about how much Greek philosophy is about being, <laughs> that was that was quite a hurdle to overcome, but they did pretty well, actually. <laughs> um, so, um, um, Actually, I think what more what happened is that sometimes like new terminology emerged because of the way certain words work in Arabic or Latin. Um, uh, that yeah, people started to notice new possible questions that you wouldn't have asked about the original. Um, but. Um, um, yeah, as philosophical translations go, those are my favorite in <laughs> those medieval translations. You couldn't get away with doing that now, of course, right? Like translating Kant into English that barely looked like English because it was full of German syntax and, you know, stuff like that. Um, all right. Anyway, uh, what was I saying before I got those questions? Uh, I was talking about Aristotelianism, and I was saying how Aristotelians disagreed that Aristotle was right about almost everything, but they disagreed about everything else because they disagreed about how to interpret Aristotle, right? So there would be arguments back and forth where each side would support Aristotle in their um, defense. And of course, attack the other person's interpretation of Aristotle. Um, and roughly speaking, I mean, I hope it's clear that this is a ridiculous oversimplification. Roughly speaking, what happened at the beginning of early modern philosophy was that people decided to stop being Aristotelians. Why did that happen? That's complicated, I guess. But anyway, that's what happened. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so after that, they, uh, in the early modern period, they all agreed with each other that Aristotle was not mostly right about everything. But that also meant a lot of agreement with each other and with Aristotle. Right, because um, in order to argue against someone directly, you usually, this happens constantly in the history of philosophy, you usually have to you end up adopting a lot of their terminology and way of thinking in order to be able to argue with them. So these kind of anti-Aristotelians um, had various things in common. Um, and one thing they had in common was, was this. Um, um, so according to Aristotle, and then all Aristotelians, although they don't necessarily agree about what any of this means, they all say the same thing, right? So according to Aristotle, in order to have any knowledge about the world, we need two powers or faculties of our mind. One is sense, 
right? Like the five senses and the other is reason or intellect. These have to work together for us to have, for us human beings to have knowledge about the world. So one of the things that happened in early modern philosophy was that most of these people agreed with each other that that's not true. You only need one of these. But which one do you need? So that was the question. And some of them said, you only need this one. And some of them said, you only need this one. So the ones who said you only need this one, reason or intellect, are called rationalists. And the ones who said you only need this one are called empiricists. So that's 100B and 100C, right? 100B is rationalists. And 100C, which is this course, is empiricists. So this is a disagreement about what we now call epistemology. Okay? The world, word epistemology itself is from the 19th century, but it's the word that describes what, that we have now that describes what this argument is about. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that studies what, if anything, we can know and how we can know it, right? So this is an argument about how, how it's possible to gain knowledge. Is it by using reason or is it by using the senses? Um, that goes together with another branch of philosophy known as metaphysics, and that is an ancient name, right? Although it's been used to mean a lot of different things, what we usually use it to mean now, at least in analytic philosophy, what we usually use it to mean now is um, the branch of philosophy that's about what kind of things exist and what kind of causes things have and stuff like that. Um, right on the most general level, basically. That's what metaphysics is about. And metaphysics and epistemology have to go together somehow because on the one hand, like the metaphysics has to be able to explain, right? Like if I say, um, well, the way we know about the world is that it affects our senses. So metaphysics has to be able to explain what kind of thing we are and what kind of thing our sense organs are and how other things can affect them and all that stuff in order to make that story about knowledge possible. And the other way around, if I'm going to claim that there are the following kinds of beings in the world and whatever, then my epistemology better explain how someone could know that. Right? So the two have to go together. It's not always clear which comes first. In the early modern period in general, it's more the epistemology first, but that's not always completely clear. Um, so in other words, the strategy is often to figure out what kind of things we can know and then use that to determine what kind of things we're in a position to claim exist. Um, so we have this basic disagreement about epistemology, which also somehow gets reflected or is based on disagreements about metaphysics. Um, and on each side, there's the there's like the big three philosophers. Um, exactly how these lists originated. Um, is a little bit complicated, but Kant is part of the answer. Um, right, so these are the three people we read in 100b, Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. And on the empiricist side, we have Locke, 
Barclay, and Hume, right? This is, this name is pronounced Barclay, not Berkeley, even though Berkeley, California is actually named after Barclay, but that's a mispronunciation. <laughs> okay, um, so um, Locke, Barclay, and Hume. These people are actually a little bit later. So in fact, Locke is not so much a competitor to Descartes as in some ways a successor of Descartes. Right. In fact, um, um, Locke uh, reported that one of the important, like the important moments that um, led him into philosophy was reading Descartes' Meditations. Um, and you know, sure enough, like Descartes, Descartes' dates are. 1596 to 1650. Um, and Locke is 1632 to 1704. So by the time Locke published the essay that we're going to read, Descartes had already been dead for quite some time. So it's not like like a in parallel, and in fact, um, um, Leibniz and Locke were contemporaries, although Leibniz lived longer than than Locke, um, and Hume lived until seventeen seventy six, whereas Leibniz died in seventeen sixteen, I think. I write that down here. Yeah, 1716. So um, yeah, so like I said, this is a little bit later. They're not exactly coordinate series. Um, and um, so this is a way of dividing early modern philosophers into two groups. Not all important early modern philosophers are on these groups. Uh, I mean, for one thing, everyone in this group is a dead white male, and you know there were um, uh, women philosophers in the early modern period, they were mostly neglected by later readers. Um, um, if I had the energy to completely rework this course as I might try to fit them in, but I don't. So, uh, but there is, uh, but there is a, um, well, let me just say, it's not only those people. There's a lot of people like Hobbes and Newton are the two examples I always mention, but there's other examples you could mention of, of very important philosophers in this period who just don't fit this division very well. Um, and they're not part of it. So, um, and in addition, all these people and the other people talked about other things besides epistemology and metaphysics. Um, so I'm going to introduce right now this distinction. I'm going to talk about it more later. But I have to introduce in basically every course. The distinction between theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. So here, like theory versus practice doesn't mean um, it doesn't mean mean what we ordinarily mean now by a distinction between theory and practice. Like in theory, this would work, but in practice, it wouldn't. Is what we say now, and what we mean by that usually is that the theory according to which you would work is not a very good theory, right? It's like left something important out. <laughs> so, um, uh, so that's uh, like an interesting distinction for various purposes. It's not philosophically very important. Um, 
Um, this is a fundamental distinction first made by Aristotle um, and who introduced this terminology. Um, and then, I mean, people used it from then on, but then it was given a big boost by Kant, who, who also used it in a fundamental way in his system. And the distinction between theoretical and practical here is, it's a distinction between two different kinds of questions you can ask. A theoretical question is a question about like, what is true? Ray, I wanna know, uh, um, whether something is true or not. That's a theoretical question. A practical question is a question about what I should do. Right, so those are just, I mean, of course the answers to those are relevant to each other, but they're not the same question. Um, so, you know, like if I wanna know, should I drink this? Suppose I had a like glass of liquid here and I say, should I drink this or not? So I'm going to not want to know the answer to some theoretical questions, like what's in the glass? Is it water? Is it poison? Right? Like I get to know, want to know the answer to those questions. But uh, even after I answer those questions, there's still a different question about whether I should drink it. Should I or shouldn't I? That's the practical question. So theoretical, so epistemology and metaphysics are, the, are parts of theoretical philosophy, right? They're questions about what's true in the world and how we can know it. Whereas practical philosophy is basically ethics and politics or political philosophy, right? It's questions about what we should do, which ultimately come down to or at least a lot of philosophers have thought this, ultimately come down to ethical questions. Okay, I see I've been ignoring a lot of questions in the chat here, so I should go back and look at them. Let's see. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, I didn't even know what I was saying. Josephine made a number of questions. I don't even remember what I was saying at the time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, something about Germans, whatever. Uh, okay. Um, ontology. Ontology is part of metaphysics. There's other parts of metaphysics, as we'll see. Uh, with John Stuart Mill, that's actually not how it's spelled, but uh, yes, John Stuart Mill. Yes, so empiricism, unlike rationalism or continental rationalism, which kind of, um, so like what happened at the end of this period is the publication of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. That's the end of early modern philosophy. And I'm about to say something about Kant, but um, so after that, continental rationalism didn't really continue. Instead, we got various post-Kantian philosophy. On this side, though, British empiricism did continue. And John Stuart Mill is part of that 19th century tradition of British empiricism. Um, there were two different main schools. There was There were the English associationist philosophers and John Stuart Mill is a central figure on that side. And there were the Scottish common sense philosophers started by Thomas Reed and continued by various people on that side. Um, um, and those people are actually really interesting, but uh, there isn't room for them in this course. <laughs> um, Okay. Are theory and practice the same in theory, but not in practice? No, no, all right. I'm not kidding, Scott. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So um, what I was going to say was 
Right. So these people also talked about ethics and politics. And those, some of those other people, like Hobbes, of course, and uh, had a lot to say about ethics and politics. Um, Rousseau, who, you know, is even, well, he's a contemporary of Hume. He actually stayed with Hume for a while and then uh, got paranoid. Or, I mean, he was paranoid. Like, unfortunately, he was like literally had paranoia and he started thinking Hume was plotting against him. But anyway, sorry, that's a digression. Um, so like this isn't the only way you could divide these people or, or you know, structure the history of early modern philosophy. Why are these the two courses we have? Basically because of Kant, right? So like Kant, among other things, brought back a version of the Aristotelian view that you need both of these faculties to have knowledge, sense and reason or intellect. Um, and so he looked at his predecessors from that point of view and said, um, yeah, they've each of them has only got half of it. And moreover, they divide into these two schools. And um, and he thinks that he can show that in some sense they all, they made the same mistake, but that the like the empiricists went one way with it and the rationalists went the other way with it. But it's really one mistake that he called transcendental realism that's behind this whole development. And you know he was going to come to set it straight. And Kant was so influential that. I mean, not that this is a bad way. I'm not saying, you know, this is a this is a this is a decent way to understand the history of early modern philosophy, but it's not the only way you could do it. There's other good ways you could do it, but this way has become so important because it's Kant's understanding of his in Kant's theoretical philosophy of his relationship to his predecessors. Um So therefore, I mean, because that's what's really behind dividing the history of early modern philosophy this way, these both 100B and 100C are mostly about metaphysics and epistemology, at least the way I teach them. Um, but uh, and um, uh, I guess I should say, and I'm going to say this because this is the word Locke is going to use. The Latin version of theoretical is speculative, right? This is Greek and this is Latin. The Greek um, theoria was translated into Latin as speculatio. So, um, it means, like, in ordinary Greek, it meant being a spectator, basically. Like, or, like, being someone who attends a ceremony or something like that. Um, but Aristotle used it in a, to mean, well, what I was trying to just explain. <laughs> so, anyway, theoretical or speculative philosophy. Um, so, that's the course is mostly going to be about that. That is about metaphysics and epistemology. But um, for reasons I was just explaining and for other reasons too, I guess, those things, this can't be completely separated from practical philosophy. And um, all the people we're reading also wrote about ethics and politics. And at least in the case of Locke and Hume, Barclay was a little bit of a weirdo when it came to that. I don't know. Maybe it would be worth thinking about that more. But anyway, at least when it came to Locke and Hume, uh, they're both like important figures in the history of ethics, as well as the history of uh, epistemology and metaphysics. Um, so, I mean, uh, we have like designed the reading to, to bring that out at certain points. Um, in some versions of this course, I actually read Hume's second inquiry at the end, which is one of his books is uh, specifically about ethics. Um, 
this year, I kind of alternate. This year, we're reading the dialogues concerning natural religion at the end, um, which uh, is about, also really is a lot about ethics, but um, is like in the, con in the context of, well, religion. That's right, that's what the title is. That was concerning natural religion. So anyway, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, okay, are there questions about any of that stuff before I go on? Because I do have another thing to talk about, at least one other thing. Two things, really, yes. Let's see, oh. <laughs> okay, there's been another quote from Josephine about uh, Scottish common sense philosophy, which you can read if you're interested. Um, okay, <laughs> um, Scottish common sense philosophy is really cool. And I have taught some graduate seminars about some of these people, but I don't know if I ever get to them in an undergraduate course. Anyway, um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is, and this part is a little bit, well, I guess this part was already a little bit hokey in certain ways, but this part is even more so, but still I want to say something about it. So these schools are typically not just known as empiricists and rationalists, but usually they're known as British empiricists and continental rationalists, right? Where obviously the continent in question is Europe. <laughs> Right, so there's British empiricists and, the, and then there's the continental rationalists. Now, um, why is that? Um, I think, you know, I mean, in some ways, especially on the continental side, that, that's a little bit of an artifact of our own way of looking at things. Like, I think, you know, um, Descartes was French and Spinoza was Dutch or like Spanish Jewish or Portuguese Jewish Dutch <laughs> um, and Leibniz was German. I don't think they necessarily thought of themselves as continental. Um, uh, they did all write mostly in French and Latin. Um, so they had that in common, but that wasn't, you know, um, except in the case of Descartes and French, that wasn't even their native language. French was a lingua franca, as they say, right? <laughs> um, so uh, um, in the case of the British empiricists, I think they do have more of an actual consciousness of themselves as a British school. Although, you know, on this side, too, um, it would be a mistake to ignore the difference between England and Scotland. So, right, Locke was English. Now, Barclay was actually Irish. So that is, he was born in Ireland, which means technically he wasn't British at all. Right, that Ireland and Britain are two different islands. <laughs> um, but he was Anglo-Irish. So uh, he was actually, he was born in a castle in Ireland because he was part of the occupying English nobility in Ireland. <laughs> um, uh, right, so, um, so in effect, we have two English people here and one Scottish. Um, um, and as I was just saying before, in the later period, just after that, English and Scottish philosophy actually diverged, right? They were like recognizable English and Scottish schools. In this period, not so much, but still, you know, that you shouldn't forget about that. Hume was very well aware of that because Hume, although he was Scottish, his most famous book in his own lifetime was his History of England. He wrote a multi-volume History of England, which is actually uh, 
Um, that I did, I listened to that on uh, LibriVox re recordings and with driving back and forth to Santa Cruz. <laughs> um, and uh, it's very entertaining history of England. Um, but, you know, so he knows perfectly well that there's England and there's Scotland and he, like, and um, how Scotland became part of the same kingdom, kingdom as England and so forth. Okay, all right, now we have a serious question from Josephine. Okay, actual serious question time. As I understand the history, there are sort of two key events in making Britain a thing, the union of the crowns and the chamber, James the Sixth, and then the formal founding of a single kingdom under Anne. Does British empiricism start before or after those? So it's, um, It's after the union of the crowns, but the uh, Hume is after the act of union as well. Barclay Locke is before the act of union, and I don't know about Barclay. Um, but uh, but um, So, like, it was already the case that people spoke English in the lowlands of Scotland before there was any political union, right? So, like, there, I think even before that, there was a sense of um, Britishness. Um, um, And I'm about to say something about how they different they were in the Middle Ages. Okay, all right, let's see. Okay, Michael Pollan's last book. All right, Michael Pollan is interesting, but uh, don't take it too seriously. <laughs> Maybe the case that the introduction of caffeine to Europe fueled the Enlightenment. Uh, uh, but what fueled the introduction of caffeine to Europe? The discovery of the new world. That happened before there was caffeine. All right, anyway, maybe not. Maybe it was tea. I'm not sure what he thinks. I shouldn't say that. Maybe he thinks it was tea. Were they used as symbols of British, were who used as symbols or what used as symbols of British um, Locke, yeah. Berkeley, and Hume. You mean like by later people were Locke, Berkeley, and Hume used as symbols of British? I mean, So first of all, if you wanted a symbol of British intellectual superiority, you would probably want to choose Newton. <laughs> that would that would work better. But uh, um, and most people who are later who are big fans of Locke, Berkeley, and Hume are also fans of Kant, but not all. Yeah, like I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a hard question to answer. That's okay. Just curious. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, sometimes, and hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about this, that sometimes Locke is used as a symbol of British intellectual inferiority, right? People think that Locke is kind of slow. And... Uh, um, put that down to, to, you know, kind of coarse British thinking. Uh, okay, um, yeah, there's more, speculation in the chart, not in, 
in the chat, not in this sense of speculation about what caused the enlightenment. I, like I said, I think it's a lot of things happened around the same time and it's really hard to say what caused what. There was the Reformation, there, a lot of things happened. Um, probably shouldn't be put down to introduction of caffeine, but, uh, but who knows, maybe it's that. All right. Um, um, okay. So what I wanted to say a little bit about, although I guess I'm going to try to make it fast. Well, so I forgot to say something about Locke before you start reading Locke. Um, but I just wanted to say something a little bit, um, again, speculative about like what, what made British philosophy different? Like why did British philosophy tend towards empiricism? And not as if everyone in British, so first of all, Hobbes in a way is not an empiricist. There was also an important school of like uh, Neoplatonism uh, in England, they were not empiricists, but um, um, but I do have some things to say about this. So one thing is that um, pre-modern British philosophy already had its own kind of identity. Um, and right, I guess I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm gonna erase this whole complicated picture here, just so I can write a couple simple things about. Right, so in medieval, philosophy, there was a dispute over the issue of realism versus nominalism. Now, I'm going to say more about realism versus nominalism at some points later in this course. I know from experience you're going to find what I say about it confusing. <laughs> um, but I'll just say, like, the simple thing is, and this also is something I, say, I have to say in almost every course, Right, so real comes from the Latin word race, which means thing. This comes from the Latin word nomen, which means name. The dispute between realism and no nominalism is about something like whether certain words name a thing or not. Like an example would be, um, um, the tallness of Socrates, like the height of Socrates, or his being five feet high. Let's say he was five feet high, I don't know, five feet tall, right? So like, is Socrates one thing and the five feet tallness of Socrates another thing? Or is the name, the five feet tallness in Socrates, just an indirect way of naming Socrates himself, and there's only one thing. That's the basic issue between realism and nominalism. And the main proponents of nominalism, so the most important or most famous and most radical, well, at least, there may have been even more radical nominalists earlier in the Middle Ages, but um, the most radical, the ones I'm going to talk about, <laughs> which are only two, is William of Ockham, Ray, famous for Ockham's razor. Um, so what Ockham's razor really meant, right, people now use it to mean like, choose the simplest explanation or something like that. But what Occam's razor really meant that it was the principle was that you shouldn't multiply entities without necessity, right? So that like you should admit as few things as you possibly can. So that's what made him a radical nominalist. And um, his predecessor, John Dunce Scotus, who was Scottish, that's why he's called Scotus. <laughs> um, 
uh, I think Dunce is actually like a place in Scotland, and if you go there now, they have a statue of him. Oh, but anyway, um, uh, Scotus was not nearly as radical a nominalist as Occam, but the basic idea of nominalism was already worked out by Scotus, I think. Um, so this was a kind of, I mean, this is a little loose, like in the Middle Ages, you know, people moved back and forth from Oxford to Paris. So like both of these people, I think, pretty sure that's true of Scotus. I know William of Ockham definitely. Yeah, no, they both taught in both Oxford and Paris. So to call them British versus continental is a little bit loose, but they were, they were both, you know, from Britain. And in some way, this school of nominalism characterized British philosophy already um, in the pre-modern period. Um, now, uh, nominalism is not the same thing as empiricism, and realism is not the same thing as rationalism. But there are connections between nominalism and empiricism. And in particularly, uh, in particular, uh, there's a kind of nominalism in Locke, and there's even there's going to be an even stronger kind of nominalism in Berkeley, which I'll explain when we get to. So, um, um, so this might this there might actually be a historical explanation here for why empiricism especially took root in England. Another possible explanation is. Um, so even before the Reformation, um, England was to some extent a center of resistance to papal authority. At least, so I don't know. I mean, to, so, that may partly be a mythical later self-understanding, but certainly Hume emphasizes it in his history. So it was something that British people like tended to think about it themselves anyway. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to go too far with this. Like the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages fought a war against the Pope. You know? So it's not like this was the only place there was resistance to papal authority. Um, but um, um, but there, there was that um, pre-existent tradition. And then after the Reformation in England, England became the main Protestant power in Europe. There were, I mean, it wasn't the origin of the Reformation and it wasn't like um, all Protestants lived in England and actually Anglicanism was like not very radical Protestantism. Um, that, that caused some wars in England and there, but in any case, um, uh, but England became the main Protestant power in Europe, and so like England or Britain, you know, like the idea of defending Protestantism was somehow part of the national um, self understanding, and that might seem like it's more relevant to practical philosophy, right? Like ethics and politics than to epistemology and metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to a certain extent that's true, but there's kind of a weird footnote to this, which is about transubstantiation. So transubstantiation, is the view or the dogma that um, in the Eucharist, the two species are changed into the body and blood of Christ. So like the wafer actually becomes the entire body of Christ. Now, um, of course, it doesn't look like, or feel like, or have the size of the body of Christ. It still looks, and to all sensible tests, is a, is a wafer. But uh, you know, 
it's like Thomas Aquinas discusses this and says, like, you know, uh, the the senses might tend to deceive us here, but our reason, corrected by faith, teaches us that it's actually not a way for now. It's the body of Christ. Um, so, um, and Protestants, well, it's actually interesting. So Henry VIII, when he first took um, England out of the Catholic Church, um, he actually was a fan of transubstantiation um, for whatever reason. And so um, even though like most Protestants rejected it, he was very insistent that we still believe in it. And uh, if you didn't believe in it, you could be, you know, tortured and burned at the stake. And people were. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not really funny, but I guess it's, yeah. So they were even, they were like informers, you know, that so, like someone would come up to you and be or like provocateurs, like someone would come up to you and be like, you know, that transubstantiation stuff is kind of weird, isn't it? And if you said yes, they would be like, they would go tell and the police would arrest you or whatever. So um, that was under Henry VIII, but under his um, successor, um, Edward VI, that was reversed. And now England agreed with all the other Protestants that there is no transubstantiation in the Eucharist. And now you could be burned at the stake for saying there was transubstantiation. And again, some people were. And then uh, Edward VI, successor was Mary who tried to bring England back into the Catholic Church and so again you had to believe in transubstantiation and then after for Elizabeth from Elizabeth on you were not supposed to believe in transubstantiation and so like one of the founding articles of the Anglican Church the 39 articles this is article 28 Transubstantiation or the change of the substance of bread and wine in the supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of scripture, overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasion to many superstitions. Right. So, um, so like part of Britishness is attacking transubstantiation. And this may seem like a weird footnote to us, but it didn't seem like a weird footnote to them because like people within recent memory had been burned at the stake over this. And not only that, but they had fought like a you know huge war all over Europe, um, partly about this, right? So um, 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 and that of course does have some relationship to empiricism. Um, that is, so like Locke, Barclay, and Hume um, all think that, uh, well, okay, so first of all, just on the level of metaphysics and epistemology, if you're an empiricist and someone says, here's something that looks, smells, tastes, has the size and shape of a wafer and to all your senses resembles a wafer, then you say, well, that means it is a wafer, right? Because all our knowledge is based on our senses. So you can't know anything about this that goes against what's revealed by all your senses. So empiricism is naturally suited to attacking this doctrine. Now the rationalists also had trouble interpreting it, um, but um, 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 But they at least had a chance of reconciling their doctrine with transubstantiation, whereas empiricism is pretty much out and out. I mean, no doubt philosophers can make anything work. No doubt you could have an empiricist theory of transubstantiation. 
I think actually Elizabeth Anscombe was trying to do something like that. But be that as it may, um, uh, at least on the surface, it seems like empiricism is perfectly suited to attacking this. Um, moreover, I think Locke, Barclay, and Hume, all three of them had a feeling that getting people to deny the evidence of their senses and or maintain doctrines that are literally absurd, that um, that wasn't just a manifestation of excessive papal power, that the Pope could do that, but there was actually a technique of it. Right? So that, that getting people to um, believe their senses and their common sense, again, um, was a, a politically important move. Um, so, I mean, you know, this is all a little bit like this connection I'm making is all a little bit or a lot weak, but we will see, and I'll point out when we get to them, that how often transubstantiation kind of bubbles up in examples these people use. Like one of the most common examples of something that's absurd that you, that you know could never happen is for the same body to be in two places at the same time. Well, right, that's exactly what happens with this, right? Because if, well, first of all, you know, Christ is sitting embodied in heaven next to his father. So that's one place. And then there's all these like people celebrating the Eucharist in different places at the same time. And the entire body of Christ is in all those places at the same time, right? So that's what they're getting at when they choose that as an example of something absurd. Um, okay. There's probably more to say about, I know someone would like Nietzsche would say the reason the British are empiricists is because you know, they're a nation of shopkeepers, right? They're like, they don't have, a, what, imagination? That's not the right faculty they're invoking. But in any case, they're, um, they're somehow, you know, they're like immersed in sensible life, and that's why they tend to be empiricists. Um, I, you know, I doubt that's a good explanation, actually, but who knows, maybe it is. All right. Okay. Um, are there questions about any of that? I see there have been a lot more comments, but I'm not going to read them all. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's weird to call it Occam's razor because that is where he's from, not his name. It should be called William's razor. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated what people get called. Like, I mean, it's true. I always call Thomas Aquinas Thomas because I say Aquinas it's not like his parents were Mr. and Mrs. Aquinas. Um, but I think it's common traditionally to call him Thomas, St. Thomas. Scotus is usually called Scotus. He's not, not called John. <laughs> um, and Occam is often called Occam. Um, yeah, some people sometimes people are called by their toponyms. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. I'm not sure what Matt is talking about. I think maybe you talk to someone else. I think papers are funny. Oh, okay, sorry, there's an error on the syllabus. 
That's what that's about. The syllabus says 30% for exercises, 15% for each short paper, and 30% for the final paper. But that's a mistake. I'll correct that. Um, it's because when I had online only versions of this course during the pandemic, I, well, never mind. It's a complicated story, but there was another 10% that I had to make room for. And now I don't have that. So I should go back to the papers being 20. Okay, that's the answer to that. And the other question is are we in person next lecture or still only Zoom? And the answer is next lecture still on Zoom, and uh, but hopefully by then I'll know what the situation for next week is, and I'm hoping next week will be in person. But stay tuned. Okay. Um, so oh, there's only a few minutes left. So I'll just say a little bit about Locke. Um, and I guess I'll say more about reading Locke next time. Um, I mean, the essay is really, really long, and Locke is very long-winded. <laughs> um, and I think his trial, his his style will try your patience to some extent. Um, I mean, in some ways, you have to, in some ways it's just an older idea about what good writing is, and you have to just kind of get into it. Um, it was. A, at this period, it was true both in English and in German, and I guess that in both cases it comes out of Cicero. <laughs> but it was it was thought that the the best writing style was to write these long sentences that were kind of like puzzles, where like until you got to the end of the sentence, you would get to the end of the sentence, and then you would have to go back and like unpack it to figure out what it meant. <laughs> um, that was considered to be very good style. That, of course, is the opposite of what we now consider to be good style. So um, uh, I think after a while, you can get into it and see what they saw in it. But anyway, uh, I apologize for that. I'll, you know, um, but I also want to say about Locke that he has kind of a he has kind of a bad reputation in, in two respects. I think um, a lot of people uh, have the impression either that Locke is kind of not too bright or that Locke is kind of nasty or both, I guess. Um, um, so I don't think either of those things are true, actually, at all. Um, in fact, the more I read Locke, the more I respect him. Um, and, you know, I'm going to try to present him in a way that makes it uh, look like he is bright and is not nasty. <laughs> but um, but you should be aware that that reputation is, is out there. Um, um, I know Stanley Cavell, who was my teacher, writes somewhere that it was like um, only Locke's English common sense like prevented him from becoming the kind of skeptic that Hume was, you know, by which he meant that like Locke didn't just didn't notice the skeptical arguments that he was getting into or the skeptical problems he was getting into. Uh, I don't think that's fair at all. Um, um, as far as the nastiness part goes, I mean, you know, that like partly, so like this, Locke was involved in the founding of the colony of Carolina, um, which was a slave colony. Um, and uh, so like, in, when I teach Locke in 144, the political philosophy course, I get into more exactly what happened there and um, to what extent Locke should be held responsible for that. Um, 
I don't have, since my time is up, I don't have time to say anything about it now. Maybe I'll say a little bit about it next time. Uh, the other the other thing, which also I talked about more in 144, is that Locke defended the institution of private property. Um, now, the truth is we all pretty much are used the institution of private property in this society, or actually in almost any society. Um, but it does, like, I guess, uh, have a bad name in some quarters. So if you want to see all philosophers denounce it, then that might make Locke seem, I mean, not more than any of the other people. All these people defended private property, but for some reason, Locke is the, ends up being the villain there. Um, Both of those things actually will come up a little bit in this course, and I'll talk more about it then. But I, um, like I said, uh, I don't think I don't think any of that amounts to Locke being a, a particularly evil or nasty philosopher. Um, okay, uh, that is all I have time for. So I will see you um, on Wednesday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.